Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, since, since I'm a Swede, I've been asked to talk about this chap, Carl Millis, Swedish-American sculptor. He was Sweden's most famous sculptor for a long time. Every major city in Sweden has a large public sculpture by him. And uh, my hometown, for example, Gothenburg, has a giant statue of Poseidon, about 25 foot high and a fountain, enormous fountain, full of sea creatures. And as a young kid from a fishing village, I was enchanted by it, standing there as a kid over and over and staring at these creatures, mystical creatures, and tried to identify them, because I was a naturalist. But most likely that didn't occur in the real world. <laughs> Carl Millis was definitely one of the foremost sculptors of the 20th century of fountain designs with fountains all over, including in the US. Washington DC, Chicago, St. Louis, uh, Kansas City, and of course, and St. Paul, Minnesota also. <laughs> and uh, of course, this piece here which was originally commissioned for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York City, for the indoor pool uh, dining hall. And it was commissioned in 1949, and it was cast in Florence, Italy. And the last piece of this thing uh, arrived in New York City, 1955. Millis died nine months later. So he never got to be there for the dedication. And then, as you all know, in 82, it was re the Met got remodeled. They took this sculpture out, and it ended up here, thank God. The sculpture is much happier here outside, where the light can play over it, and we can see it in different lights and everything else in nature. Uh, Carl Millis was a mystic and a naturalist. He grew up in Sweden's nature and he was enhanced. He really, well, he was basically in love with no Nordic mythology. It was, that was some of his inspiration to begin with. And then he fell in love with the classical era. And he collected Roman and Greek marble sculptures, and he had a lot of them in his sculpture park in Stockholm, our capital. So this sculpture is inspired by the Greek mythology, the Greek Aganippe, the fountain of Aganippe, that flows from Mount Helion. And it was absolutely sacred to the muses, because if you drink of the water, it will give you incredible creative inspiration. So let's all have a drink, all of us. <laughs> or, or maybe later, yeah. And Millis actually described this in his own word. I've seen that in his document in his museum. He said that the five figures out here, five figures out here, they symbolize the arts. And it's young people that have drank from the fountain and they are rushing home full of inspiration and excitement. Each one, each one with his or her um, new ID which forces them to hurry. That's why it looks, that's what Miller said about this. And each one carries the symbol of his art. So up front, we have the poet with the bluebird. Next, we had the architect with a new column. Then we have the musician with an old instrument, a horn. And then we have the painter with his flower. And by the way, 
Miller said that he wanted to symbolize Delacroix with this sculpture. He loved Delacroix. He, he was most Im impressed. And then, of course, on the other side, alone, we have the real artist, <laughs> the sculptor. And he is reaching. <laughs> He's reaching for his gift. And as you can see, his part is horse and, and a man. So we don't know. If you think of myth, mythology, Greek mythology, we probably have an idea what he was trying to put together, right? Part man, part horse. <laughs> and then in the back here, in the center, we have Aganippe herself. The naiad Aganippe. Although Millis called her, actually called her a goddess. And she is waving and wishing the artist good luck. And then on the left, we have a centaur, all kind of dressed up and looking, mirror himself in the water, in the magic water. And on the right, it's a fawn taking music lessons from a bird. This is what Millis described. But most importantly, with this fountain is that Millis talks about the interrelationship with all the arts, which I feel very, very passionate about. And, and I, I think all of us know that art inspires each other. It's all part of the same process. And for example, Delacroix, he wrote himself, he said, he depended on music to be able to paint, for example. And I certainly depend on music to be able to sculpt. I have it running in my studio, classical music. I want to say a few words about Carl Millers, since he was our Swedish kind of hero. He was born in Sweden, 1875. He's, after finishing studies in Stockholm, in Sweden, he moved to Paris, like all the artists of that time. And he lived there for seven years. He studied at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and exhibited at the Salon, uh, where he won some recognitions, some awards. But most importantly also, he worked with famous artists, including Auguste Rodin. And Millis's early work definitely showed a lot of Rodin influence. Then, when he came back to Sweden, he became the professor at the Royal Academy in Stockholm. And were there for a few years. And then in 1931, he moved to the United States. And he was appointed professor at Cram of Sculpture, or actually director of sculpture at Cranbrook Academy. And Cranbrook, as many of you know, have a lot of his monumental work, including another fountain. Millers became a fellow of National Sculpture Society and a U.S. citizen and several of his students become prominent NSS members. The, the, his, his foremost uh, student was Marshall Fredericks, who we know has worked here in the, in the park and stuff. But all those years he still maintained a home a large studio and enormous sculpture park in Stockholm, our capital. And it was full of his bronzes, castings of his monumental bronzes and his, as I said, the Greek and Roman marbles. And Millis was very influential for me from childhood on, as I mentioned, and he was a great inspiration. When I went to art school in Stockholm at the University College of Art, this was in the 60s, and we were not allowed to do realism. Representational art was not the language of our time, our professor said. And here is a kid from nature and romantic, from fishing village. It was hard on me. So, after Millis died, by the way, he donated everything, his sculpture garden, everything to the Swedish people. 
and it became one of Stockholm's finest museums with all those things. And his studio was still there when I was in art school with enormous plasters and it still had clay on the cracks in the floor. So I sat there dreaming as a romantic young kid and I thought if Millis could do it, maybe I could too. Sort of the contrast sculpt representation instead of the harsh reality in art school. And 50 years later, last summer, I had a retrospective exhibition in his museum upon the 50th anniversary of my graduating from art school. And that was very emotional for me. And the circle is closed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.